here at the Australian Grand Prix meeting at Warwick Farm on the 21st of November. The cars are on the grid for the Chesterfield Touring Car Challenge Race, an event held in two heats. Each race, 10 laps or 22.5 miles. On the front line, we have car number eight, that's Brian Foley in the Alfa Romeo. Also on the front line of the grid is car number two, that's Norm Beachy from Victoria in the Holden Monaro. On the second line of the grid is car number one, Ian Gagan, the local driver in his Ford Falcon. 16 is Michael Stillwell, the Ford Escort. Then number four is Dennis Marwood, the Chef Camara on the third line. You see him back in the background there. And then Bill Fanning is just the extreme right-hand side. They're the front six on the line. But a great battle on the front here. Brian Foley, Norm Beachy, Ian Gagan. Great trio. Breaks out less than 10 seconds to go. It'll be Rose with five seconds to go. And we'll work out who jumps the start the best. a little bit of creeping now. Ten laps to go. Norm Beachy. Norm Beachy, look at Gagan pushing through past Foley, so it's Beachy and Gagan in front of Foley around the first lap. Now here you're going to see an unparalleled coverage of the Warwick Farm Circus. Our cameras are placed in very strategic positions as the whole host of cars. Now here from Homestead Corner, for the first time you're going to see this shot as they come over the western crossing and approach the fast part of the track, which is Hume Strait. Now this is a long, magnificent shot of these cars coming around this area here. And when they straighten up as fast as they can go down the straight. Now let's look from the straight now. And here they come and they have great conception of speed here. As it's car one in front, Ian Gagan has shot through to take the lead from Norm Beachy. And car seven in third place, that's Bob Jane. And here's a spin-off, number 16's off. That's Michael Stillwell as they go around free corner and into the S's. Now, looking through from our SS camera, this is another angle of the track. We can see every inch of this Warwick Farm circuit of two and a quarter miles. Marvellous camera positions, Graham. Yes, indeed. It makes it look even more frightening than it probably is down there, I'd say, Norman. Now, across the northern crossing, and you see it's Ian Gagan who shot through from the second line of the grid to head Norm Beachy in picture now in car number two. Brian Foley, we don't see. This is the causeway with the uh, little lake in the middle. And let's pick them up as they come round about halfway round the track, or two-thirds of the way round. It's Ian Gagan in front, then Norm Beachy. We saw Bob Jane was there, and the little car of Brian Foley is fairly well up there too. Now, they come up out of the causeway, and you see the whole fleet of cars coming round here now, and they're almost making contact. Well, Norman, almost, I think, is something of a euphemism, but uh, we could count the straight panels when they come back in afterwards, if you'd like. Final corner for Ian Gagan. Round he goes. It's Gagan straightening up, and there's big machine roaring down the straight. One, two, seven, eight of the order. One, two, seven, eight, eleven. So in front, it's Ian Gagan, Norm Beachy. Number seven, third is Bob Jane, who is well back on the grid in the Chef Camara. Brian Foley and the little Alfa Romeo is running fourth and Bill Fanning is in fifth place, and the spin-off was Michael Stillwell from Victoria, the Ford Escort on Creek Corner the first time round. Ian Gagan over again in uh, the straight. Interesting part about this track, Graham, the fastest part of the course, which is Hume Strait, is followed by the slowest part, which is Creek Corner. It's very sneaky that way, yes. In fact, and we can see there, incidentally, that Bob Jones got around the outside of Norm Beachy and consolidates his... Uh, rather tentative second place by slamming across in front of beaches they start off for the S's. Certain different designs of these cars. I notice there is a different type of um, these um, production cars, Graham. Well, these, these are improved production cars that are actually leading the race. The first uh, five at least are improved production gadgets. Um, distinctive at this day is that uh, the, the really fast ones are powered by just under five litres of V8 engines, Ford or GM, and uh, that running a, a virtually another race within the race, a long way further back, and some serious production cars which started down towards the top of the field. Well, let's get a conception of speeds here as they come round. Uh, looking at the records here for Warwick Farm for these production cars, of course, the outright record is 124.8 for racing cars held by Frank Matich, who will be performing in the Australian Grand Prix. But the production cars is about 136. Uh, Alan Moffat's Ford Mustang, 136.8. That's a sizzling time grab. Yes, it is, uh, Norman, considering the, the, uh, the bulk of the car and the, uh, the fact that it's not got terribly sophisticated suspension compared to the, the racing cars, which are lapping uh, really the fastest racing cars, only about another 14 seconds a lap, 12, 14 seconds a lap faster. Now, the leader's in lap three and approaching the top of the straight. We see one and two, and look at the race. Look at Brian Foley, the little car, is right up with the big fellows, and Brian Foley, uh, I think, well, he must rank as uh, the top... Here's a number, here's... 
Bob Jane going straight through him. Bob Jane on the inside going past Ian Gagan. And it's Bob Jane in front. But look at Gagan coming back. Now they're right in this breaking area. They're down to practically nothing. But Bob Jane, who was well back on the grid, has hit the front. Bob Jane in car seven, the Chef Camaro. Number 52 has spin out. That's one of the uh, series cars, unfortunately. He's not had a terribly good day so far. That should be either Digby Cook or Jeff Leeds. And uh, he's had trouble in the uh, earlier series race as well. So it's not proving to be a terribly good day for the Blue Tirana. Now, over the Northern Crossing in lap three, Bob Jane in front with Ian Gagan, who was the early leader, right behind him in car one. Uh, behind them would be Norm Beachy, car two, Bill Fanning, 11, and Brian Foley, who was the pole line position. Brian Foley, now car number eight, the Alfa Romeo. Yes, I've got a feeling that uh, Gagan's biding his time at the moment, Norman. He goes up on uh, Jane wherever he wants to, it seems. And uh, he might be just playing a waiting game at the moment. I think the car that Gagan's driving now is a fairly new gadget. It's basically a, an Australian-type Falcon GT with considerable development work put into it. It's not been raced by Gagan for very long. I think he's still trying to get its measure. Well, look at the qualifying times, Graham. Bob Jane did a 146.5 in qualifying, and um, Ian Gagan was five seconds faster, 141.6. But Brian Foley was the fastest quali qualifier in 140.5. So Bob Jane was concentrating, I think, getting the car ready for the race, and now he's opening out. Well, he was uh, considerably handicapped yesterday by the conditions of the road. It was fairly slippery yesterday, which is partly why Foley's so well placed on the grid. He uh, didn't have quite as much embarrassment of power, and he can get around a little faster on a slightly damp track. And look at that crowd in the background, a huge crowd. This would be the first day of real summer in Sydney. Uh, a glorious day, the best weather we've had for a couple of months on a Sunday, and the crowd have turned out in full force, and you can see them in the background right down the straight. They give us a wonderful idea of speed. They're probably getting up well over the 100 mark down their ground. Yes, a good touring car is, is working its way up to somewhere between 120 and 130 miles an hour. They're not geared for sheer outright speed here so much as medium speed acceleration. The farm's got a lot of corners at around about 80 to 100 miles an hour, and that's where it's very important. Well, we'll just uh, give you a look at the margins between the lead cars as they come through. First of all, we see Bob Jane, the white car of Ian Gagan in the background. Third through should be Norm Beachy, and Brian Foley is just behind Bill Fanning. And those top five, then that huge gap to the next car. So those top five are way out in front. And there's an idea of this margin. They've opened up a gap of something like 45 seconds. Now, here's the next car coming through, the next group of cars. So we'll follow up with this. That's uh, Bob Holden in his uh, twin cam escort. We've uh, lost the other really interesting escort, which was Michael Silvers in that spin on the first lap at Creek. So it's veteran Bob Holden, the Sydney driver, running now in about sixth position, but a long way off the pace as far as the leaders are concerned. You can see Holden pointing his way, running a little wide on the uh, exit from Ledger Corner. That's the corner which precedes Pit Straight. Sorting things out again. He's been racing a wide variety of motor cars over many years. First came to attention in Victoria in the uh, middle 1950s in a Peugeot and he's raced just about everything ever since. This gives us a great view from Homestead, Graham. This looking from the grandstand side, it doesn't seem to be as great a curve from here, but looking from head on, it is a great curve there. There's quite a lot of manoeuvring to get through. It's almost a small set of S's before they get to the top of the straight. Yes, I would imagine in a fast car that, that there's virtually no time at all for relaxation through that section, even though there are some apparently straight sections on the road, there's not much chance of relaxing. Dennis Marwood in car four, just behind um, Brian Holden, these two. But here's the leader again, car number seven, Bob Jane, the Seb Camaro. He took the lead in about the second lap in the straight, went past um, Norm Beachy, Ian Gagan is next, followed by Bill Fanning and Brian Foley. But Bob Jane is out in front as he comes round what I should think would be lap six. Yes, well, Jane seems to me now to be consolidating a lead, which I didn't think he'd managed to get away with. Uh, Gagan is gradually dropping back. And uh, Beachy in third spot is going to have to work fairly hard to keep the littlies off his back, I'd imagine. Well, we've mentioned times. Um, let's see, the, um, we gave the production record here as 136.8. Well, let's take a lap as they come down. Uh, Gagan's coming down. We'll just, there's the leader going through now. We've got the clock on the leading car with Gagan, so the two of them virtually being clocked. We'll take them right round the course. Now, the left's overtaking one of the slower cars. There's the leader out in front. He's covered 10 seconds now as he comes into the 
Western Crossing, 10 seconds, up to 15 seconds, probably to the top of the straight, 15 seconds now. It'll take him, we think, about around about the 140 mark or less to complete the whole lap. Now, here's the fast part of the track. He should reach the end of uh, Hume Straight in about 30 seconds or just over. He's into the braking area now. That's Gagan we're watching. Or Beachy, rather, in car one we're watching. Oh, brother, Ian Bagan, we're not talking about Ian Gagan in one and Beachy in two. But Axel Leader is just in front. They've covered 40 seconds now. 40 seconds of this lap with the clock on them. They're into the S's. Car seven is Bob Jane. Car one is Ian Gagan. Now, it takes about a minute for about a 1.38 lap to get into the middle of the causeway. So it's up now to... Uh, 58 seconds coming up, so he should be coming into this causeway area. Over the crossing now, that's the minute. Out of the causeway, up to Polo Corner, then the long sweeping right-hander into the final straight to end the lap. One minute, 14 seconds have gone now. Repeating that that lap record is 136.8. This will be an unofficial time. But Bob Jane comes up to Polo Corner. The clock coming up towards the 130 mark. It's 126 now. Up to 130. And let's see how close to 136.8 he can go as he makes the final turn. He'll roar down the straight at 135, 136. Now a slower car has held him up a bit. It's going to be a fairly slow lap. It's 140 now as he comes down, held up by those cars in front, and his time will be round about 145. Yes, 145, one. The next gap to car number one, which is Ian Gagan. Uh, still a reasonable gap to car number two, followed by number eight, Norm Beachy, and Brian Foley really pushing up on Norm Beachy, followed by Bill Fanning. And here's the battle here between car eight and car two. Now, this is a great yeah. battle. And you can see Beachy in there really using those powerful arms to point the Monero around Paddock, Sorted out again for the very fast corners approaching Homestead. Look at Brian Foley applying the pressure in a car that looks about half the size. It look, looks like a, a father and son combination coming down the straight, but uh, a little Brian Foley famous for his work in these smaller cars. Uh, in the Victorian, Norm Beachy, who really is a great crowd pleaser here. He's one of the real favourites at Warwick Farm, Norm Beachy, I'd say. Yes, I'd imagine the Beachy fan club is out in force. Look at that front wheel, though. Was, was uh, that some desert? Is there a wheel wobble on his right-hand side? Let's watch this. It, just, it may have been a reflection of light there, but it just seemed there was something a bit weird. See, he's, he had a bit of a wobble that time. We'll see this as he comes round more towards the causeway. Perhaps it was light reflecting, but let's see exactly how it is. Yes, well, Beachy's wheels are a very distinctive pattern with five very large holes cut in them. They're basically a large aluminium disc, a, a cast aluminium disc but uh, I think it might well be the cloverleaf pattern of the, uh, the holes drilled in the wheels which is giving us this impression. On the other hand, the car certainly doesn't look to be terribly controlled. Uh, here's the leader coming down. Uh, we may have miscounted here, so the chequered flag is not out at the moment, so this is probably the end of lap number nine. Roaring down the short straight here, and around he goes again. The chequered flag still in place. We're watching down to the official. Yes, the official moving over towards the flag, so yes, the chequered flag is coming out, so this would be the last lap for the leader, Bob Jane. And he roars round here into the straight. Uh, he'll give this car in front a bit of a shake-up. I imagine he'll catch this little fellow before the end of the straight. Look at the speed now, roaring past him, maybe well over the 100 grand. Yes, the difference in speed there would be, I'd, I'd say, approaching 40 miles an hour. They've got some traffic problems ahead of him. It's unlikely that he'll be actually held up here. But uh, these things can happen. Flag marshal. You saw the oh, beauty yes. of those flag marshals yes, over there. Very the, hard down the S's. That's the blue flag to indicate got cars behind you. Here's the leader coming um, on the final circuit here. He would have lapped probably two-thirds of the field over the northern crossing he goes for the last time. Yes, he's just passed Bob Forbes in one of the series production charges. I'm surprised that he caught Bob Forbes quite as quickly as that. Out of the causeway up to Polo Corner. For Bob Jane, only 20 seconds or so left in the race. coming out for Bob Jane and there's the winner and let's take the margin he's 
four seconds now. It's going to be five seconds to Gagan. Eight seconds to Beachy and a further fraction of a second to Foley. So the order, as we saw them past the line, would be first, car number seven, Bob Jane, the Chef Camaro. Camaro. Second, car number one was Ian Gagan, the Ford Falcon. Third, car number two, Norm Beachy, the Holden Monaro. And fourth, Brian Foley in the Alfa Romeo. About 45 seconds to go to the start of heat two of this Chesterfield Touring Car Challenge race. Here's Graham Howard. Thank you, Norman May. The results of this race will be combined with the results of heat one to give us the final overall position. Winner in the first heat, of course, was Bob Jane. Jane has some faster cars ahead of him at this stage, but uh, he demonstrated in the first heat that in fine weather, he's presently the fastest of these cars. Less than five seconds to go. Once again, Beachy on the outside, gets the big engine to work. And he's launched into the first corner ahead of Foley, and there's Gagan going around Foley as well into second place. Foley relegated to third. And Bill Fanny coming up very strongly behind Foley now into fourth position as the field storms away across the crossing and down towards Homestead for the first run down the straight. There's the full field through, and now the leader's coming out from under Dunlop Bridge at the foot of the straight, and Gagan already raging alongside Beachy under brakes. And Beachy having none of it, holds Gagan out. Jane already up to third position ahead of Foley, and back behind Foley is the small dark colour escort of Bill Fanning. And now we start to get down to the midfield runners, very heavy traffic down at Creek Corner on the first lap, and Beachy all over the road, trying to keep Gagan behind him, and Jane the undoubted menace already in third place as they come out from the S's at the end of the first lap. Still very close together and Gagan working hard to try and size up Beachy, try to get through and put Beachy between himself and Bob Jones Camiro. And here he goes now, ranging up inside Beachy and there's nothing that Beachy can do about it now. He's got to very quickly tuck back in there to stop Bob Jane coming through and very nearly Jane loses the position to Brian Foley. McEwen briefly and we've lost one of the uh, well, we've obviously lost a tyre there and that's Noel Devine from Victoria who's not had a very good race meeting one way or another apparently lost a wheel and approached the causeway and came to a somewhat involuntary stop and the leader's now storming out into pit straight with Shane challenging Beachy for second position Gagan well established in the lead and there goes Jane through on the inside of Beachy at the end of pit straight and Jane now up to second spot and setting out after leader Gagan. Through these very fast sweeps on the approach to Homestead corner of the straight and still Bill Fanning hanging on very well there in the little twin cam escort. And now the gap's starting to open although the time in fact doesn't vary very much down the straight. And Jane and Gagan occupying the first two positions almost within touching distance of each other as they come around Creek. And Norman Beachy indulging in more of his exuberant sideways driving as they come out from Creek. And a retirement there from the Pat Peck Holden Tirana XU1. And the leading cars lining themselves up for the very bumpy progress across the causeway. It's now a Jane versus Gagan situation. Around those rather vaguely defined sweeps at the top of the lake, now under brakes, peeling off left onto the causeway where Devine's charger has already been removed. Gagan starting to spin his wheels and Jane's thumping through on the inside, claims Polo Corner, relegates Gagan and he's over. He's miscued and Gagan slips nicely through and I think he's waving ceremonially to Jane as they go down the short straight towards Ledger, making a very willing race of it all together at this stage. Now the situation here is that if Gagan should win this particular heat, and at the moment he's uh, being very, very hard pressed by Bob Jane, should Gagan win, then the points that he gains will total the same as Jane's, as a result of Jane coming first in the first heat, and the overall race time will now decide the issue. Well, Jane's possibly superior to Gagan and the Clakes. The foot of the straight wheel now, and there's Jane closing up on him visibly.
little more than a coat of chrome plating separating the two cars as they come out from Creek. Jane sizing up Gagan again, working very hard, the pair of them. Once again, this very heavy ride across the causeway, which is noticeably bumpy, and there's Jane making another move onto the causeway. He's trying to pressure Gagan into leaving him a hole somewhere. Here yeah, for a moment, you can see daylight on the Gagan's inside front wheel. And he's keeping the road well covered on this particular time through Polo, where Jane had an attempt to pass him the lap before. And there are the two leaders going out of picture. On the screen now in third and fourth is a continuing dice between Norm Beachy and the two-leader alpha of Brian Foley. A small, nimble Italian changing a very, chasing a very large and powerful Australian. And the difference in the styles of the two motor cars very obvious as they come round now through the fast sweeps approaching Homestead and the run down Hume Strait. Bill Fanning, incidentally, in the little twin cam escort, keeping them well in sight. Now in the braking area at the bottom of the straight. You can see that Beachy's established quite a useful margin on sheer power and a straight line. Now through the twists, Foley will start to reel him back in. The little Alpha looking very neat and tidy compared to the rather bulky Holden. Beachy, you can see, working very hard there. Foley visibly starting to close up on him now, around the top of the lake. In the meantime, back with the two leaders. Still in the same order, still going leading from Jane at Polo. Very little between these two cars in cornering power or straight line acceleration. And Gagan, of course, a very wily driver will not leave Jane any opportunity if he can possibly avoid it. Jane again trying to get on the inside of Gagan for the braking section at the end of the straight and Gagan just ever so casually moves across, holds Jane out on the wider line, maintains his lead. And Jane's putting him to considerable pressure here. Gagan on some rather unusual lines, I think. And there he is sideways at about 110, 115 miles an hour at the top of Hume Strait. Jane sub subjecting him to continual pressure and now I think he's got him. Yes, he's gone through the hole that Gagan left open and it's got to be Jane first in the corner. Well, that was executed with just so much confidence that there was very little that Gagan obviously intended to do about it. Jane had his measure. Two leaders continuing now around the top of the lake. Jane, if he can maintain his lead to the finish of the race, will certainly win this two heat combined race. And he's gradually drawing away from Gagan. shot now across to Ledger Corner. Very, very long. 80 mile an hour right hander. And that looks like Foley's chances as Beachy bobbles just slightly through Ledger. Foley's on the inside running for the corner and finally Beachy has to concede and Foley goes through into third position. That was the end of lap five of this ten lap race and the order is seven, one, eight, two, eleven. Bob Jane in front, followed by Ken Gagan and Brian Foley, Norm Beachy and Bill Fanning. The interest in the first five cars, numbers 7, 1, 8, 2, 11. And we've just lost Bob.
Bob Holden with a fairly big accident coming out of uh, Ledger Corner and the yellow flags being shown. That's Bob Holden's twin cam escort which has uh, hit some very substantially fast and armco fencing. You can see that there's um, a fair amount of attention being paid to uh, extracting the driver from the car. There's the windscreen which popped out being retrieved. At this stage, judging by the... And Beachy has retired. Just at the beginning of the S's. He steps resignedly out. There's nothing he can do about it at this stage. And here's the leader, Bob Jane, coming out from Polo, heading down towards Ledger. Fairly secure at this stage from challenge by Ian Gagan. Very wide line by Jane. Obviously the road is getting slippery. Just caught a glimpse of Gagan in second place behind him. And Gagan obviously is having trouble with the slippery road as well. The leader now on his final lap. As far as Jane's concerned, it's just a matter of staying on the island. Having won the first heat and now seemingly assured of victory in the second heat, he should carry out the two-race series. But behind him you can see Pete Gagan really putting his heart into it, getting the White Falcon very sideways coming out from Homestead. Now here's Gagan's Falcon. The road all to himself in second place. And it looks as though they're taking some uh, precautions with Bob Holden. Rather impressive lack of flurry down here at the scene of this accident just near the pits and fortunately Bob Holton is fairly well protected inside with a roll cage proper harness nice strongly constructed car meanwhile Bob Jane in characteristic fashion fairly close to the wheel head pressed forward lining up the causeway for the final time Obviously slippery, Jane working fairly hard behind the wheel to keep the big red Camaro pointed where he wants it. Now the final drag down from Colo to Ledger. Slipping past a slower car in the process. And leaning into the corner. And he takes the checkered flag. Gagan finishes second. Well, that confirms. Bob Jones' victory in the Chesterfield Filter Touring Car Challenge Race. Having won both heats, there's no way in which he can be tossed for overall victory. Pete Gagan, who finished second in both races, will finish second overall. So the position is in that race, the order was Bob Jane first, Ian Gagan second and Brian Foley third. In total points, Bob Jane with two first placings, a total of 18 points, wins the series. From Ian Gagan at two seconds, a total of 12 points. And Brian Foley moved ahead of Norm Beach to take third place. So in the final point score, Bob Jane 18, Ian Gagan 12, Brian Foley 7. And there's the winner, Bob Jane, car number 7.